So as I'm sure all of you are well aware, tonight's topic is highly controversial and divisive, and we have received several comments over the past couple of days, both positive and negative. We have over 275 people registered tonight, so clearly the community is passionate one way or the other about this topic, which was the reasoning behind offering this program. As the community's library, we seek to enable informed, respectful conversations among our residents to promote unity and growth for all. Tonight's presentation on critical race theory is based in research using scholarly sources and presented by educators. However, as a public library, we are open to offering different viewpoints based in research for a different program on this topic in the future. We will have time for Q&A after tonight's presentation, but due to the number of people attending tonight, we will not get to everyone's question and only those questions that are in the Q&A section of Zoom will be addressed. If using the chat function, we ask that everyone remain respectful and open as the goal tonight is for all of us to learn. As a reminder, Wheaton Public Library's patron conduct rules do apply in this virtual space, which includes that we prohibit using abusive or threatening language or engaging in other disruptive or inappropriate conduct. With all that being said, I am so honored to introduce tonight's speakers. We have Dr. Horace Hall. He's an associate professor at DePaul University, teaching in multiple departments and programs such as educational policy studies and research critical ethnic studies and African Black diaspora. His scholarship investigates four key areas, racialized geography, institutional exclusion, youth voice and activism, and policy transformation. He's published a number of volumes and his continued efforts to combine theory with action, Dr. Hall co-founded and co-directs a Chicago-based youth activist program called REAL, Respect, Excellence, Attitude, and Leadership. Since 2000, REAL has worked with countless Chicago youth and their families in challenging political and economic inequities prevalent within Black and Latinx communities. And we have Dr. Kennedy Strickland Dixon, who's a program, Director of Programs and Services. Prior to this role, she served as the Director of Special Education at Oak Park and River Forest High School for six years. And earlier, she served as the first African-American Director of Special Education at Maywood District 89 for eight years and the Director of Special Education and Student Services at Bellwood District 88. In addition to her current position, Dr. Strickland Dixon is heavily involved in promoting professional development that explores the needs of African-American students in the educational setting. She's presented at several professional conferences and is a guest lecturer and dissertation committee member at DePaul University, where she received her doctorate in educational leadership. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Hall and Dr. Strickland Dixon. Thank you both so much for being here with us tonight. Dr. Strickland Dixon, I think you are muted. Yes, I am muted. Sorry about that. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> let me recap, let me recap that. that. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hall is going to start. You, go, you, should, you should go first, Dr. Strickland Dixon. You go okay. first. I'll go first. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who registered for this event. Um, you could have been any place else this evening, but you chose to spend this evening with us. So for that, we say thank you. The first thing we want to go over with you is the session objectives. So what we're going to cover tonight is the definition of critical race theory, discussion of six primary tenets of critical race theory, practical implications of critical race theory, why is, race, is critical race theory under attack, and closing thoughts to consider moving forward. So as we open with the definition of critical race theory and the discussion of the six primary tenets of critical race theory, I'm going to yield the floor to my colleague, Dr. Horace Hall. Who, who is no longer muted. <laughs> who is no longer muted. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Um, thank you. Um, once again, thank you. Uh, you didn't hear before. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, um, and um, we hope that your openness um, will be um, an offering to this to this webinar. Um, despite the the, the political uh, football or politicization uh, that critical race theory 
um, has been. So um, to begin, um, um, I just want to be clear about a few things about critical race theory, aka CRT, um, that uh, that I'm that I'm seeing um, in the present national debate on this topic. Um, and the first thing is that I want to say that uh, you know critical race theory is not um, a conspiracy theory of victimization. Um, and it's certainly not a, um, it's certainly not about highlighting victimhood. Like, um, you know, oh my God, look what's happening to black people today. Um, what do we do about it? Um, and conversely, um, this idea that, well, if we do these things for black folk, um, that um, white people then become victims, right? And so that is rhetoric. Uh, that I believe is divisive and obscures um, what uh, CRT is. And we'll go into uh, more of that later. Um, two, and I want us to consider this, is that CRT is not about reproducing power, dy power dynamics. You know, despite what you've heard, what you've read, um, uh, that have come from secondary tertiary sources, CRT is not about reproducing power dynamics and cultural structures to give people of color power over white folk. Um, what CRT does propose is um, getting rid of those power dynamics altogether. So in other words, um, changing racist structures that undergird politics and laws in order to level the playing field. And I hope that makes sense. And we'll go into it later. Um, the third one, and this is what I've been thinking about, um, is that, and, and, and I've been you know, reading more about in the news uh, uh, about CRT being used, misused within K through 12 education, um, is that CRT is not about pointing the finger at individuals, right? And calling them racist um, or making children and adults feel bad. Right, that is not its purpose. It's about emphasizing when and where racist policies and structures exist uh, that further racial inequity um, and what we can do about it. So now um, discussions about race and racism um, are never easy, uh, particularly when we have to face American history, its laws, its policies, um, and when we have to face ourselves, not easy, never easy conversations. So I don't, I don't know, um, I don't know what's in your heart and what's in your mind, um, uh, but I do ask that since you are here tonight, um, to put forth some energy to being open, um, receptive, uh, respectful, um, as my colleague and I talk about some of the research policies and impacts of racism through the lens of CRT. And mind you, we're just talking. We're just talking about this. We're clarifying. We're not, we're not imposing. We're not persuading, right? Um, these are, I, this is to clarify and enlighten for some folks who may have been um, who may not have a, a deeper understanding of what critical race theory is. And so with that, uh, I, wanna, I wanna pose some guiding questions to you uh, to think about as we move through tonight's discussion. Um, and the first one is, um, it, as, as a community of wheat, uh, what, is your, what is your goal in having these discussions? And more specifically, is, is racial equity um, um, the goal of your community? And if racial equity is the goal of your community, um, how will you achieve racial equity in and outside of schools? So what is your plan? What is your strategy? Um, what is your tactic, if there is one? And I think that for me, and maybe we can put this you know, as, as, a, as, as a part of a later discussion, um, and this is this is the last guiding question. 
and and I have to ask this, and I ask this of all of all folk when having these kinds of discussions, these these kind of uncomfortable discussions. Um, does racism still exist? Do you believe racism still exists? Um, have we gotten over the racial hump? Right? Do we still see racism in today's society with respect to industries of of education, of healthcare, of policing, housing? Um, the wealth gap, um, and so just to make it clear, and, and I want and and and, and I want to I don't want to make note of this, is that you know CRT, um, no matter how adversarial you think that it may be, um, or how important you think it may be uh, to your respective culture and community, um, it seeks to explain why the income gap between whites and people of color has remained virtually unchanged for decades. So, and what I mean by that wealth gap, and when we look at, um, 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 I think it's data 2019 from the Federal Reserve is that, uh, you know, white families have the highest level of average family wealth in America, roughly at $980,000, right? Black families, their mean or average wealth is about 15% at 140,000 annually. And Latinx families, their average wealth um, in America is 165,000. That's, that, that's the wealth gap. And that's part of the, part of the premise and understanding um, some of the ideas around critical race theory is, 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 under, is, is, is looking at and focusing on uh, the disparities in the wealth gap. So if you are interested in um, an understanding racism and the impacts of it on black and indigenous people of color, um, then you are in the right place for sure. Um, if you are not, or you are somehow on the fence about all of this, um, we still think that you're in the right place because our goal tonight is, is not to once again persuade you, but to merely inform you uh, and hopefully um, add some clarity uh, to once again, this rather strange national debate surrounding critical race theory. Um, so with that, um, can we go to slide three? We are there. Take it away. So critical race theory, just a few um, um, points to summarize, uh, derives out of critical legal studies, uh, which is a movement in the 1970s, which largely focused on inequities within US jurisprudence or law, right? Um, these, these sources that are listed at the end are essentially primary sources. Right to go to, so never mind secondary or tertiary sources that you might find on the internet or, or um, um, social media. I implore you to engage in primary sources to further your understanding. CRT later developed into a more expansive social scientific approach to the study of race and racism in society, the work of civil rights leader, and with regard to Black people scholar Derrick Bell Jr. in his seminal book Faces at the Bottom of the Well. Once again, a primary source. Bell's principal argument was that racism is much more than a single determining factor of a given inequality. Rather, it is a system, systemically fixed and enduring facet of hierarchical social structures. So it's not something that we can just dispel and get rid of. That it is essentially something that is deeply embedded in the social, moral, and political fabric of society. And it's often confused as a natural process uh, than by a byproduct, a byproduct of systemic racial domination. I um, mean, in, in today's perceived post-racial society, CRT is essential, um, according to critical race scholars, um, as it reminds us that race and racism are socially endemic, and diagnosing these phenomena demands meticulous um, analyses of systems of inequality beyond random incidences. So it's not, it's not stochastic, it's not individualized. Uh, that this is something more broadly, uh, a phenomenon that's more broadly 
um, relevant in the lives of Black and Indigenous people of color. So um, to go through some of the six primary tenets of CRT, um, um, and others have been added, but these are the six general ones. Um, the first one is whiteness is property. Um, based on power relations and property interests for those identifying as white, benefiting from social advantages where white racial identity provided the basis for allocating societal benefits, both private and public. Um, that is the law has treated and protected being white as right from the smallest possession, a lamp, car, um, your barbecue pit, whatever it is, uh, to housing or land. Um, and this is key to consider because essentially what this is saying and to make it plain is that the courts vis-a-vis -vis the law have recognized that, um, that reputation and, and status as a white person are property of that person and the law should protect them um, and their status and their capital. And that's significant, right? And so um, when we talk about the law, we're talking about um, the Bill of Rights, um, the 14th Amendment, most significantly. Um, um, and this idea of capital, um, primarily financial, right? Uh, but it's the financial which also ultimately maintains cultural capital, right? So how one speaks, the language of the social mores in which they engage in, human capital, so the resources within the community that they're in, um, um, whether it's a segregated community or multicultural community, so on and so forth, uh, social capital, um, the individuals they can pull on um, um, within their respective, um, you know, more, more, more intimate than beyond just human capital. And then of course, symbolic capital. Right, which speaks to um, um, their status in society. So with, with respect to the permanence of racism, um, the transformation of racial prejudice through the use of power directed against racial groups and colorblindness and anti-affirmative um, policies aid in the permanence of racism. For example, um, votes in uh, less populous states hold more electoral sway uh, than votes um, in um, urban states. I and mean, we've seen that with uh, Senate Bill 202 um, out, of, out of Georgia. Um, so what the premise of racism is essentially saying, and just to make it plain, is that any amount of racial advancement is temporary. Um, it's temporary progress as it will eventually slip into um, irrelevance when racial patterns readapt that maintain white status or white dominance. Um, um, low, we forget that this country was built on um, colonized groups from Europe um, and not an equitable space for all black and indigenous people. Um, that's a history that we cannot um, ignore, uh, escape or erase. Um, an example of it more contemporary is the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibits racial discrimination um, um, in the US versus, once again, the Senate bill of 2002, which some believe has restricted voting elements that negatively impact uh, black voters, which is an ongoing discussion. Um, we at number three. Oh, these are conversions. So the premise that um, oh, I lost it. The premise that people of color accomplish racial justice only when it coincides with the benefits and interests of the white power structure. Uh, the interests of Blacks in achieving racial in equality or equity will be accommodated only when it converges uh, with the interests of whites. And so the signature example of interest convergence is, um, there's a number, but I think the, 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 the singular one is Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, 1955. A decision which um, was less about 
producing um, laws, or, or rather, repro or rather, producing um, less concerned with the with the production of inferiority complexes in black children, and more about how desegregation raised um, the nation's prestige and the world politics with respect to what was happening at the time around the Cold War. So it was one thing for the, for, for the US to be concerned with um, being a symbol of democracy at this time, but how could it if democratic values were not being expressed um, in its own, on its own soil? And so um, one of the key elements, once again, is the, is Brown versus Board of Education and then late the civil rights movement. And so uh, this idea of interest convergence is that this only benefits, these, 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 these gains only benefit um, um, white folk if, um, black folk, if white folks get something out of the deal. And that's a hard pill to swallow for a lot, for a lot of people. Um, but, um, Nevertheless, we see that happening across different laws and policies and amendments going from the 13th to the 14th to the 15th uh, within the Constitution um, and forward. Um, number four, intersectionality. And so intersectionality originated from the Black feminist work of critical race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw. This study provides a basis for identifying how complex identities overlap and shape specific ways cultural biases and experience uh, through race, class, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, and other social constructs. And so, for example, sexuality, race, and gender um, in the workplace. So, more specifically, um, once again, coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw going back to 1989, um, it begins as this really obscure legal term. Um, but it essentially describes the way people from different backgrounds um, 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 encounter the world. So, for example, um, the lived experiences and experiences of discrimination of a Black woman will be different from those of a white woman, right? Um, and the differences of a Black woman will be different from a, will be different from a white woman as a cis, as, as a cisgendered Black male or a biracial Japanese Irish bisexual woman, right? So um, these experiences uh, differ across the spectrum. Number five, counter storytelling. Experiential knowledge and counter stories of peoples of color that speak to racism in personal relationships, so individual relationships. So how have I, with respect to um, the previous tenant, and these are all, mutually inclusive um, um, tenets. Um, they can't exist exclusively, but um, they, can ex they can also exist um, inclusively. And so these places of how do I experience it, how do I experience racism and discrimination in places of work, education, or, judi or the judicial system. So magnifying the stories, experiences, narratives, and truths of underprivileged communities. And what's key about these narratives is that they give you insight, critical insight into the lived experiences of say, um, your friends, your neighbors, um, your, 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 uh, your coworkers, um, and equally important, um, folks you don't know. And perhaps want to know, perhaps want to know about their lives. That's key. That's key to this, this aspect uh, of counter storytelling, the narratives, the personal narratives of others. And then finally, uh, the critique of liberalism. Interrogating meritocracy, objectivity, peaceful change, um, and racial um, neutrality, uh, which camouflage the self-interest, power, and privilege of dominant groups in society through colorblindness. And the interesting thing about colorblindness is that. If you profess to be colorblind, then you, then you must profess to see race. And if you profess to see race, then you have to at least understand that, um, that racial identities have different stories 
not everyone of, of a particular race has the same struggle, the same story. Um, and to homogenize that, um, and, to, and, and, and to say, well, I'm colorblind, I don't, I don't see race, um, really means to ignore those, those, those very different experiences. And so it's because unconscious and intentional practice construct racial status and labels. Um, the gotta must address unconscious practice and policies as well as um, intentional ones and dismantle them. And dismantle is a hard, uh, it's a hard term to, to swallow. Um, but once again, this isn't about juxtaposing or replacing or substituting um, one particular status for another, right? This is about leveling the playing field. And so this critique of liberalism, the focus here is on the present system of civil rights lit litigation and activism. Um, but CRT contends that the system only brings about incremental changes and this quote unquote faith in the legal system which cannot eliminate deeply embedded forms of racism that go back to um, um, the early decades of this country. Um, a history that um, in my mind, notwithstanding critical race theory um, should be understood and should be examined. It should be examined. So I, I, I will pass the mic to uh, Dr. Strickland Dixon. Okay, so in this course, portion of the presentation, I'm going to talk about practical implications because I'm certain, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, talk as we've just been researching, we've been, you know, online ourselves, um, you know, taking comments and questions and other, other avenues about this particular topic. There are questions around, well, what are the practical implications of critical race theory? You're talking about um, a framework that has been around uh, for a very long time. So I hear what you're saying, but help me to understand how right now in our current times, not historically, but right now, as we talk about how things have changed, but yet they remain the same, how can I take critical race theory and give it some practical implications? So I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of I've been in the field of education and public education for the past 27 years. So my lens that I'm going to be talking about is, is Horace works with students on the campus of DePaul and I've worked with students, young people um, in public schools for the last 27 years. How do we work with that? How do we make certain that we are addressing that for young people? How do we make certain that we are addressing that for teachers, for staff, or just folks in the community. So I'm going to give you some practical implications around current events, curriculum, and community criticism. So when we talk about this issue of current events and movements, um, years ago, even as far back as maybe even 15 years ago, we weren't so much into social media. Now, social media is very prevalent. And so there are many aspects of the country. There are many aspects of the world that we would not be able to see to actually view if it wasn't for uh, social media, um, what's happening in our um, trusted news um, areas that we watch the news daily and those kinds of things. So when we talk about current events and movements, for those of us who are talking about critical race theory, we're not creating events to study and to have discussion about in our everyday terms. These are things that are happening. These are things that are evolving every day. So when we talk about these current events, we talk about these current movements for individuals who may be um, watching us tonight who work in um, school districts. The thing that we're given a charge to do is as these things happen, how do we position ourselves to talk to students about these events? How do we position ourselves to talk to our particular board members, people in the community? How do we position ourselves to talk about these current events and movements, which are very much, when we talk about that um, storytelling element, which is tenant number five, we're able to visually see 
to play out in front of us the lived stories of those individuals. So when we talk about those current events and we talk about the, ra the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans, we talk about the deaths of Sandra Bland, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, the movement of Black Lives Matter, the building of a wall to separate America from Mexico, bias related crimes against Muslim Americans, hate crimes against Native Americans. These are all a part of our indigenous people, as we've said, these are all a part of our current events and movements. So when we talk about the practical implications of CRT, these are things that are uh, playing out right before our very eyes in current events and movements every day. So as we talk about those current events and those movements that take place, what is the place of those things? Um, how relevant are those things? How important is it that we talk about? So when we talk about the, the impact of race and racism in curriculum and current events, as my colleague has shared with you in the definition, we talk about whiteness as a construct that promotes colorblindness. When we talk about the fact that many school districts are at a place where they are adopting curriculums each year that are absent of in-depth opportunities to discuss the impact of race and the development and sustainability of this country. The counter story of those individuals demonstrating resilience in response to the impact of racism are absent from curriculum as it exists. As I shared with you all already, I've been working in the public school system for the past 27 years. And so in my role in the public school system, um, seated in the central office, various positions, looking at things like curriculum adoption and how we review various curriculum and we're trying to make certain that the curriculum is culturally relevant. It's a struggle for many school districts because again, absent from the curriculum, we hear the, the story, the richness of our history as a country, but what's absent is for those individuals that have been resilient in the face of some of the things that have happened in our history that maybe have not been so favorable for individuals of color, what are their stories? And that's what counter storytelling comes in. And then also when we're looking at children, we're looking at young people who are seated before us in classrooms across the country, what are their stories? What are they bringing into the classroom? And how are we making that meaningful? How are we making their racial diaries meaningful um, in the classroom setting every day? So when we talk about um, how that impacts and not only in the classroom, for those individuals who are here from community programs as well. When we talk about soccer teams, when we talk about community baseball teams and all of those things, how are we making the experiences of those diverse individuals how are we validating those experiences, acknowledging those experiences exist and bringing those experiences, experiences to a place where we're promoting it as something positive and our work with young people in schools and our work with young people in various community organizations. So that's when you we talk about that impact and how it spills over into schools. It spills over into um, all of the work that we do as communities. And then the last point about community criticism, open sessions, open attacks. We know we've all been um, very well aware of the various stories that have existed in the news and our local news and our national news as critical race theory has really promoted over the last year or two, a great deal of discussion, a great deal of uh, several scholars opposing many of the tenets of critical race theory. So here's what we see. We see that in, within public school settings across this country, we are seeing more and more that during board meetings, communities are expressing their concerns about critical race theory being discussed, being taught in school districts. This is a concern that's happening all over the country. So we're hearing that. We're reading that. Uh, we know that there's a great deal of criticism um, and demands that do not acknowledge critical race theory as tenets with scholarly merit. So there are many who are present in school settings, who are present in community settings, saying this theory 
is, is, is built upon falsehoods. It doesn't possess scholarly merit. And we, we would like to have it removed from conversations because it's, it's not based upon um, anything that is scholarly um, in the opinion of many. And then the last thing is about social media is being utilized by scholars, um, individuals opposing the tenets of, of critical race theory and the promotion of the tenets as falsehood. And again, as my colleague said, our purpose of meeting tonight is not to convince anyone to agree with any of the information that we're sharing. We're just coming as an informational source this evening and grateful to the Wheaton Library for giving us this opportunity to come as an informational source. And however individuals may want to in interpret the information, it is you know, complete up to the individual. We are in no means trying to, again, convince our role tonight is to just bring forth the information. Okay, so I'm going to yield the floor to my colleague before we move to closing thoughts. Well, I mean, I think that you know one of the things that you that you mentioned, um, Dr. Shepard Dixon, um, is um, how um, critical race theory, um, um, African American history, uh, Black studies, um, which has become like. I think a lot of that's become a catch-all uh, for critical race theory. Um, when we look at it, when we look at um, um, laws that uh, and policies that are on the table uh, in different states, um, and administrators um, um, at virtually every district across America are facing conflicts. Um, um, and insisting that they're they're not teaching critical race theory, but they are teaching and but they are teaching anti-racist education, right? But it's being labeled as critical race theory, which is adding to the the fear around um, and the and, and the fear around uh, critical race theory. Um, and to add to that, you have I think what is it like twenty two states. Um, in early February, um, uh, they signed into law. Five of them, five of them signed into law. Um, I think it's it's Idaho, uh, Iowa, uh, Tennessee, Texas, um, and Oklahoma. Um, and in these twenty-two states, in addition to those five states, um, lawmakers have been proposing limits on how schools can talk about uh, racial issues writ large as a result of not just critical race theory, uh, but um, I think what, what served as kind of ground zero for all of this is the 1619 Project, um, which we saw in the last couple of years um, also being scrutinized, um, which um, um, in, in an already divisive country politically around race um, becomes um, highlighted, emphasized, magnified. So, now, only a handful of the bills, once again, um, that were introduced in February, um, explicitly mention critical race theory. Um, but they all contain some language um, and goals that see any teaching of historical racism and its present impact um, 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 as divisive. Um, and even racism itself, which is interesting enough. And I know there's a question in the queue about, you know, how racism is being defined. And maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that later. Um, but, you know, all the while, there's very little evidence that CRT is being widely taught in K through 12 public schools. Um, but what is being taught in K through 12 public schools, as well as post-secondary institutions, um, are black studies. But once again, um, with CRT and the 1619 Project becoming this, this catch-all, black studies uh, is being included in that. So critical race, critical race theory has become this, has become this, this catch-all um, um, in, in, in combination with black studies. Right. And so um, I think that is something that it should I mean beyond this 
this this this this national debate around critical race theory. And I promise you, folk, spoiler alert: um, a year from now, we won't be talking about critical race theory. Um, but we should still be thinking about black studies. And so, going back to that guiding question of what is your goal, if any, around understanding racial justice and racial equity. Um, if that is a premise, if that is a plan in your respective communities, um, really kind of disentangling critical race theory from the study of black folk and people of color, indigenous people of color overall. And if I can just interject for a moment, as you talked about um, critical race theory is often positioned and packaged in black studies. Um, that's because um, people tend to think about, uh, when we talk about just the racial experiences of individuals um, in this country, because there is a great deal of um, highlighting, even now uh, with Black Lives Matter, the civil rights movement and that, oftentimes this racial struggle has just been confined or condensed to the Black experience. So when it actually spreads across all those individuals who have been marginalized historically in this country, but I think that positioning it in Black studies makes it something that is more um, easier to understand or cap comprehend in that aspect that it's been so much discussion, so much, um, it, it just makes it easier when we say, we'll just you know, position it here because here are the struggles that have been most widely publicized. When in actuality, critical race theory not only speaks to just African-American individuals, it speaks to many that have experienced some elements of racism, some elements of being marginalized in this country. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, final slide. Okay, our final slide. Closing thoughts. Uh, within our closing thoughts, um, again, we wanted tonight to be something informational for um, the community. So within our closing thoughts, critical race theory is embedded in the fabric of the history of this country. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our closing thoughts. Failure to acknowledge the salience of critical race theory continues to marginalize those individuals who have been marginalized in this country. There's still much work to be done for individuals committed to anti-racist thoughts and actions this work is not easy, it's ongoing, and it's necessary. And last, we thank you and we appreciate you spending this time with us this evening, because as I said earlier, you could have chosen to spend this evening any place, but the fact that you chose to spend this evening with us, we are deeply appreciative of that. So we're gonna talk about a little bit in depth about our um, closing thoughts. And we'll, I'll, I'll yield the floor to my colleague first to just talk about um, critical race theory being embedded in the fabric of this history. And I'm gonna talk more about at the, the last information about the work that needs to be done. From in school districts. So Dr. Hall, I'll yield the floor to you in the first closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, I, you know, I want to, I want to be clear that, and I, and I want the, I want the, the audience to be clear, um, is that, you know, once again, and 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 and, and Dr. Kennedy uh, Strickland Dixon talks about this, um, is that um, CRT has been around since uh, uh, the seventies, um, uh, uh, early eighties. Um, and so the question becomes, why has it become this political football uh, of late? Um, and um, I think that's, 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 that's an interesting question. And um, as someone, as a scholar who has been 
uh, engaged in um, this particular theory as well as, as, well as other theories. Um, um, I think it's part and parcel to a lot of the device, the political device that's been happening across the country uh, in the last several years. Uh, you know, for me, CRT is not um, uh, radical in political orientation, um, um, but it is an analytical tool. Um, but perception is everything, right? So depending on, and it's relative, right? So depending on your, your particular political orientation, it may come off as radical. If understanding the needs, issues, concerns of folk of color and how that uh, intersects with laws and policies is radical, um, man, uh, I, I, I don't really get that. Um, you know, CRT does not teach race, hatred, um, or hatred of others. Um, I can tell you that. Um, um, if that is part of any school instruction, um, I guarantee that that is not critical race theory. Um, and when we talk about critical race theory, um, over the years, there have been other um, offshoots of it. So we have um, Latino critical uh, theory, uh, or what's called Latin crit, um, queer uh, critical uh, theory, um, and then um, most, um, most recently, um, uh, uh, Asian critical movements, right? Um, but when I think about this space that we're in, um, around this particular matter. Um, and I do find it to be um, strange, but also part of the, 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 the present political atmosphere. Uh, this is nothing new. And so um, I think about, and I've been thinking about this prior to uh, tonight, um, was almost a hundred years ago, um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, um, struggle to get African American history um, a part of the American consciousness um, through uh, Black History Month, which began as Black History Week, um, 1926. Um, and I'm not sure who's old enough in the audience to remember, but back in 1991, there was House Bill uh, 2859, and that was passed that year, which mandated Black history be taught in public schools. And there was backlash against that. I was part of that movement um, um, to get Black History Month um, or a unit within public schools taught. You fast forward to 2019 um, in Illinois, and I know some of you remember this, Illinois passed, just passed, um, a similar law uh, from 1991 that mandated public and elementary high schools, um, as well as post-secondary colleges, um, include a Black history unit. So a curriculum focused on slave trade, on um, uh, Black people's contributions to U.S. history, um, as well as the socioeconomic, socioeconomic struggle um, in the U.S. Um, but that hasn't, that hasn't been under attack. Um, and I think critical race there because it delves a little deeper into the law and jurisprudence um, and, and the way courts interact um, and have interacted with respect to um, uh, discrimination, racial discrimination. Uh, I think that is what's been problematic. Um, so in, in, in many forms, um, and we've already talked about this, CRT, um, um, in the form of Black studies has been around for a while. Right? And mind you, um, as I said, you know, so many politicians, so many scholars, going back to Dr. Carter G. Woodson, experienced enormous pushback um, and backlash for what they were trying to do. Now we look at it and we're like, um, oh, well, it, it just seems a part of, it seems a part of standard fare. Um, but when we're, when we're asking, and, and, and times are changing as um, history is being um, um, further researched and expanded on, um, it may come off for a lot of folk um, as revisionist or rewrites. Um, and I understand that perspective. Um, but if the excavation is part of, if that historical excavation is part of of revealing primary documents, 
um, and, 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 and how um, not just the US, but the world um, experiences, world people experience colonization and oppression. Um, I think we should pay attention to that. Um, um, you know, hiding history um, from our young people of any ethnicity uh, for me is problematic. Um, the more you know about, um, it's not about it's, 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 it's not about nationalism. Um, it's about identity. It's about knowing yourself, uh, warts and all. Um, and I, you know, and 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 there can be a misuse of it. Um, but I will say, but, and, and, and I want to add this really quick, um, Dr. Strickland. I want to add this really quick, um, is that we often um, make the mistake. It's, I, I feel like we, we look in the mirror at ourselves um, and we don't like what we see. Um, and then we blame the mirror for what we don't, for what we don't like in that image. Um, for me, the question is, why don't we look at ourselves more deep as move past the reflection as James Baldwin says, move past the reflection um, um, and look more deeply at ourselves versus taking issue um, with that mirror. Thank you, Dr. Hall. As we were putting presentation together, um, Dr. Hall brings um, pretty much that academia, that scholarly perspective of CRT, that's his, his background of where he has done a great deal of study, a great deal of research. And we, we partnered up so that we could give you the historical perspective and also bring you into a current perspective. And so again, as I've shared um, just in my role of being a public educator, here's some things that you um, can visually see in many school districts across our state. 15, 20 years ago, we did not have a cabinet level position, meaning someone who's an administrator um, is a part of the superintendent's cabinet with the title of executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That was not a, a title, a position that was a part of our public schools for many years. But now given everything that has been transpiring, again, within current events, um, student responses to current events, parent responses to current events, you will see the trend of many school districts across our state now have this very critical position. And so if you read the job description of these individuals who hold these positions, you will see that they deal a lot with making certain that the district understands and the district is on track to ensure racial equity for all students within the district, for all um, members represented within the community. You'll also see some of their work is to make certain that they're very much involved in helping to shape the mission and vision statements of the school. Years ago, you didn't see a great deal of verbiage in the mission and vision statements about district's cultural position, district's position of what they felt about diversity, their feelings about diversity, and their actions about diversity, taking into account all of the different nationalities, all of the different cultures, all of the different races that are represented within their school district. So these are things that is a sign of the times is showing embedded into how we operate. That you may see is that when we talk about those current events, those movements that take place, for those of you who are parents who are joining us tonight, it's not uncommon the school district to issue a statement regarding current events that took place surrounding race. It's not uncommon for a school district to not only make a statement, but to also provide staff members with resources of how to address with students and community members various events that have taken place. And not only that, 
resources and tool for, tools for parents as various movements and racial incidents continue to unfold, unfold in our country, many school districts provide parents with resources of how to have conversations with their children about race in a way that it is meaningful and in a way that brings parents a sense of comfort knowing that they have these resources to tackle a very difficult um, topic. So when we talk about there's much work to be done, not only in the school districts, the school districts, many have made their position very clear through adding various positions to address this very critical topic. Not only is that work being done by school districts, that work is being done by parents as well, who are asking for more resources, who are asking more support for more support is they are working with their children at home and having very engaging conversations with them around the topic of race. So that's all we had for you this evening in our closing thoughts. We will now, um, Dr. Hall, um, if you didn't have any more closing thoughts, we could yield the floor to Courtney. Dr. Hall, did you have anything else to close us out before we yield the floor to Courtney? No, no, and, and I just want to—I just want to just reiterate um, some of those guiding questions. Um, and I think what you what you what you just spoke to um, really uh, echoes uh, some of those questions. And so, what is your goal um, in terms of uh, racial equity um, 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 in your community, if it is a goal, right? Um, and 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 how does it permeate? Uh, not just within schools and communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, um, policies, you know, they cannot change mindsets. Um, but I think uh, courageous um, and thoughtful conversations can. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, if that's not your bag, that's not your bag. You know, it's just, it's just, that's just not it. And that's, and that's fine. Um, but, uh, I think uh, the first step is being open and responsive to the needs, issues, and concerns of others. And I just want to give an example because you mentioned um, my um, my work at DePaul, and I have been working with uh, the athletics department um, around um, racial discrimination and anti-racism um, experienced uh, by their athletes. And um, in the group that I had with um, some young um, um, female athletes, um, you know, they weren't caught up in this political uh, football game of uh, an obscurity of CRT or the 1619 Project or, uh, you know, Black Studies, but what they were wholly engaged in was um, hearing the stories of one another around discrimination with respect to uh, race, class, and gender, um, and so some of the some of the white female athletes um, were completely removed from that experience. They didn't understand um, of the experiences of their of their uh, black and brown counterparts, um, but that didn't matter. What mattered for them was that it was important for them to be in touch with that, um, and to empathize, if they couldn't empathize, to sympathize with that, but also to move forward collectively in changing their experiences, right? And so being allies in that work, and that was critical for them. They don't get into the, the fine tune minutia of these tenants, um, but they recognize the humanity aspect of it. And so what is my sacrifice? What is my understanding of the needs, issues, and concerns of my, of my teammate, right? Of my peer um, beyond all these constructions? What are they experiencing and how do I engage that? So moving past all the politicized rhetoric um, to see what are the needs, issues, concerns on, on a human level um, of my peers? What are they feeling? So this, this final slide, these are primary sources. Um, a lot of them are um, 
um, revised editions uh, or updated editions um, based, and you can see that based on their dates. Uh, but um, I encourage you um, to, um, to take a look, to read those, to examine those, um, um, and use those as, and, and use those primary sources uh, beyond what you're seeing um, in the ether of social media. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall and Dr. Strickland Dixon. Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, feel free to jump in if you see any that you would like to address, but we will kind of just dive right in. Um, first one, should equity be the goal or outcome or should equality equal playing field be the goal? Mm. 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 So really quick, because I see there's a lot of questions. Um, so the way that, you know, typically it's understood between the, these terms, equ equity and equality. Um, so the level, so, so, you know, the idea that of a level playing field does not necessarily mean leveling the playing field. And so wherever you are in your particular status, um, in terms of capital, right, financial capital, human resources, human capital, social capital, so on and so forth, um, um, equality would say, well, um, let's make sure that everybody's above board and it, and it doesn't necessarily address the needs, issues, and concerns from those various forms of capital for everyone. It just gives them enough sustenance to survive. Equity says, well, wait a minute, um, let's focus on particular groups and the resources and opportunities that are needed um, for those particular groups with respect to equal outcome, right? That's, that's, that would be leveling the playing field. Um, and there's a lot of folks who um, enjoy their status. Um, this isn't, you know, socialism. This is about addressing what particular gaps with respect to those different um, forms of capital are missing to bring about equity. Mm -hmm. Equality doesn't really address those, those specific gaps because it says, well, generally, let's just give money to everyone. Let's just, let's just give it to everyone without recognizing the exact holes in their particular forms of capital. Mm -hmm. And if I can just add something to that, um, a lot of times we, you know, a lot of people do sometimes need a little bit more help with equity and equality. And I'll just give a very practical um example as we in school districts are i don't want to say we're at post covid yet because we're not but as we are beginning to come off of a remote learning um, experience for students a hybrid learning experience for students and so when we talk about equality is well every student in a particular district receives a laptop okay so that's equality but if we if we took the time to dig a little bit deeper and say okay well not every student has the same level of bandwidth and internet access in their home as some mm -hmm. other students. That's a very practical example of equity. And those are some of the conversations that educators grapple with. Like, is it enough for us to just be equal? And how do we take it a step further to make certain that we are focusing on those areas of equality? Thank you. Um, another question, how is critical race theory different from culturally responsive teaching? I'll take that one. Um, and Dr. Hall, jump in, because um, I know you're going to be all over me for this one. Uh, if I don't get in everything you're going to want me to say about this topic, okay? So when we, when we talk about critical race theory, okay, it is a framework. It's a framework that consists of many tenets that speak to the lived experience of individuals. It speaks to just the framework of, of, of whiteness and how that plays out in our country. So when we talk about that, CRT is a, is a framework. It's a body of, of research. When we talk about culturally responsive teaching, we talk about um, bringing those elements of culture into instruction. CRT tells us some things that are happening 
in history, some experiences that are not so favorable. It's, it's, it talks about um, what it means when individuals are marginalized and that well, culturally responsive teaching, it, it kind of um, brings in some, some of those things from CRT, but the difference is with culturally responsive teaching, at the base of it, it's taking the culture of your students and bringing that culture into the curriculum, embedding that culture into the curriculum and not just celebrating it during, um, um, during when we acknowledge Latino Hispanic um, month, not just at a time when we are acknowledging black history, not just at a time when we are acknowledging things just within a month, but embedding it. So when we talk about embedding it, that means that not only do students of color are we bringing in their experiences, but we're also exposing other students who may not be students of color to those rich cultural histories as well through literature, through history, through music and our fine arts. And when we talk about it, it's embedded. It's not a one-off. It's not just during certain times of the month that it's embedded during the fabric of how we deliver instruction at all times. Now, Dr. Hall, go ahead and jump in on whatever I may have omitted. No, 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 that was good. That was, no, that was, that was, that was on point. Um, yeah, thank you for that response, for sure. I know there was a question about, um, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, there was a question, um, racial disparities are automatically proof of racism. What is your empirical evidence that a particular race disparity is caused by racism? Um, and 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 that's that's a legitimate question, right? Um, and you know, one of the things that I, I would point to, and and this is where it, it really becomes important for um, folks in the audience um, to understand that um, you make choices. You make choices. You have the choice. You have the decision-making ability to say yes or no to whatever political or educational or social policies uh, come down the pipe. You don't have to accept any particular theory or idea as mutually exclusive of itself. And I think that's I think that's really important to note because that question about culturally responsive education, v uh, a critical race theory, doesn't have to be that way. Those can be mutually inclusive. As an example, as an example, um, and I think that's really important. And the reason why I mention that is because um, when we talk about th this question of you know where's the empirical evidence, um, it's the kind of question that for me begs the response do the research, know your history. I mean, I can prattle off uh, the Native American genocide, the 500 year war, the Jewish Holocaust, the civil rights movement, Brown versus Board of Education, restrictive governance, um, you know, this idea that white homeowners in many US cities uh, regarded blacks as a social e and economic threat to their neighborhoods. Um, in order to maintain racial homogeneity, there was white flight. And in that uh, movement, in that movement away from urban areas into suburban and ex-urban areas, um, they were protected by the 14th Amendment. But do your own history, um, your own research, right? Um, there was the, the, the Tulsa massacre, right, in Oklahoma. There was the Elaine massacre in Arkansas. There was, uh, the Chicago race riot, right? Um, there's a book that, um, with respect to that question, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, um, that looks at this idea of, um, of the Federal Housing Authority back in 1934. Um, and the National Housing Act that, signed into, that was signed into law by Roosevelt um, um, and how it provided residential security uh, for certain groups, right? 
which led to redlining and restrictive covenants, right? So you had these maps um, um, that marked neighborhoods uh, by quality from um, um, A to D, right? With A representing the higher income neighborhoods and D representing the lower income neighborhoods. And this, and, 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 and this idea of redlining, which, you know, which some will argue still exists today, or at least um, the, the, the residue of it still exists today in terms of how communities since the 30s have been constructed. And so when we look at this, I, this, this notion of, 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 of how racism and empirical, and empirical evidence, it's not just about race, it's also about class. I mean, you can look at class issues and how they're structured around an individual's um, um, opportunity, right? Opportunity defined as the, um, the uh, condition or situation that places individuals in a position to be more likely to exceed or excel, right? And so going back to the social history, covenants, redlining is the location of those opportunities that matter for economic returns of life. So I think about uh, uh, Chicago communities like uh, Roseland, uh, Back of the Yards, uh, uh, Bronzeville, right? Um, where historically have been forgotten, right? And when we talk about forgotten, we're not, we're not talking about forgotten in terms of, of, of just education and the, school, and the, and the institution of, of, of schools. We're talking about housing, right? So the affordability of housing, the quality of housing, uh, um, um, the uh, probability of, or possibility of being lent money, right? For um, housing, um, we're talking about health, environmental hazards, uh, um, um, uh, uh, non-toxic air, water, and soil in these communities. And we know that within our own respective suburban areas, uh, that has been an issue with clean water, right? These aren't just race issues, they're also class issues, right? Jobs in terms of job wages, job growth, the proximity and access to jobs. So where you live and how, how far do I have to travel if I can get there based on where I live? My neighborhood services, banks, libraries, uh, oh my God, hospitals? So you got folks in South Shore who would rather skip uh, Jackson Park Hospital to go all the way to Northwestern um, if they're bleeding to death or, 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 you have, or, or you have seen, right? I mean, those are real issues. Um, and then of course, education. So what is the class size? What's my class size looking like? How, I, I got a teacher in my classroom um, and there's, there's 30, 40 students and they don't have a place to sit. The textbooks are outdated. The computers, the Q and the Z is missing, and the and the ball and the uh, the uh, the ball and the and, 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 and the mouse is missing. Right? Those are class and race issues, and they just don't impact black folk. They impact poor black, white, and brown folk. I mean, those are. I mean, there's an empir empirical evidence. Do the research, man. Do the research. Thank you, Dr. Hall, and I'm glad you brought up the color of law. We are actually participating with some other libraries in October um, with Richard Rothstein for, for an author talk. So stay tuned for that. We're very excited about it. Um, our next question is about the second tenet saying that racism is encoded in the law and social, social structures, and it, so it will keep coming back. Or is it saying that there's something in human nature that makes racism permanent? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, um, I'll start that one off. I'll give Dr. Hall a moment to take a pause. Um, so when we talk about, uh, Courtney, you said, is there something in nature? The second part of that question said, is there something in nature? Can you repeat that second part again? Is there something in human nature that makes racism permanent? Okay. So um, is there something in human nature? So when we talk about those things and when we talk about those things in human nature, okay, when we talk about Racism, racism. Um, looking at it from the frame of uh, being fearful of of others, when we look at it from the frame of wanting to make sure that 
I stay positioned here, these individuals stay positioned there. When we ask, is that something in human nature? What I would ask is look at the historical perspective of our country over hundreds of years. Have we seen duplications of things? Absolutely. So when we talk about, is it human nature? It's human nature to be um, competitive for some people. And again, when we talk about, uh, is it human nature? We don't mean all of human, uh, how, all the entire human race, but is it, is it human nature? Absolutely. Is it human nature without me having to say anything? Is it human nature that when I walk into a store and people don't know my position or my education and they begin to profile me in the store, is that something that someone has taught them or is that just their human nature? So when we talk about, is it, so I can take that perspective and say, it's a human nature, but I can also take an opposite perspective on that as well. Mm -hmm. As I worked for uh, many years uh, with preschool children and I looked at how preschool children, um, they don't have a concept of, of race. They just have a concept of, who I like, this is my friend, um, this isn't my friend. But what we notice over time is as they, uh, their human nature is, I just like who I like. Like, I don't know anything about anything different, how to treat people differently. But what we noticed over time is if those things be begun to be taught in the home, did it then just become human nature for those individuals to, to do that? So I'll say initially, is it, is it human nature in some aspects? I'm going to say no, because we have some individuals who have no uh, smaller children who have no concept of what it means to treat people differently from a racial perspective. But then the other piece of that, is it human nature? We just look at, look at the history of society and how it continues to repeat itself and then ask the question, is that human nature? Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, 100%. And... Um, we also, we have to recognize that, um, um, that, we, you know, there's, there's these aspects of, of, of all these isms that have been internalized, um, um, over time, right? Um, I mean, human nature at, you know, I mean, obviously it's not, pat, you know, it's, it, 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 it doesn't exist naturally, nor is it passed on, obviously, genetically. <laughs> right uh well, it is passed on across generations uh through jurisprudence and so we can see that happening in areas of transportation uh public facilities um you know you know train plane automobile uh, marriage uh for example um um, um uh, public accommodations um housing uh, and so forth. And so those are things that, I mean, most recently elections. Um, and so that, you know, a lot of this is pushback. Um, and if we, and, and, and keeping, you know, this, 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 this critical race theory um, lens in mind um, that this idea of, of permanence and this idea of, 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 of whiteness as property, um, that is not an act of nature. That is an act of law. Um, and um, when we recognize that and we're able to dissect that, deconstruct that, that's important. You know, you can never underestimate the power of denial. And it's important that if we can understand that these are things that have existed since the inception of this country, um, warts and all, warts and all, that's important. The present is the past. And to think that we have somehow come to this space because, um, oh, you know, uh, civil rights movement, uh, uh, black president, um, that this country is not divided or in this space of, inc of increased divisiveness. And then we want to blame a theory, a, a, a provincial theory that, that was at post-secondary level. Um, that has nothing to do with human nature. That's all about protecting the status quo. And that is done through policy, procedures, and practices. 
And so going back to that guiding question of what is your goal as a community with respect to racial equity, those are things that we have to consider. Do you understand the needs, issues, concerns of the person sitting to my left and right um, unapologetically um, and without these, these, these politicized filters? Everything is political. Let's, let, let, let's, let's be clear. Everything is, everything is political. But sometimes there's things that from a human level, when we talk about this idea of human nature, from a human level, beyond the law, what should we be paying attention to? Uh, next, there are several questions in the Q&A just addressing examples across the country in various classrooms of situations that are anti-white, racist against white people, and asking if you support those you know, those occurrences and why isn't that racist? Can you address any of those? You see the several several questions in there. Okay, Courtney, can you repeat that question one more time? It's basically there's several questions that are very similar about different instances across the country in classrooms, um, forcing kids uh, to you know rank themselves at, according to their power and privilege. Why? And there's various questions. Why isn't this racist? Um, do you support? this um, anti-white racism um, and that they are within the CRT framework. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to combine all of that into one question. Mm -hmm. They're limited on time. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I can take that and then- And then, okay. and, and, and then I'll- I can, Yep, yep, please, okay. please. So um, no, short answer, no. Mm -hmm. uh, do not support that. And um, critical race theory is not a proponent of that. That is not what it does. So let's be clear about that. When you go to your primary sources, you will find that that is not what CRT does, mm -hmm. right? Anything that suggests that that is the goal and outcome is not critical race theory, nor is it black studies, nor, the, nor is it ethnic studies, all right? We have to be clear about that. What it could be is the misuse and abuse of a particular framework, lens, or theory um, to the benefit of a particular political group or orientation. Mm -hmm. Let's understand that. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to, is it racism? Um, I've always defined racism as prejudice plus power. Okay, and I think we should be, I think we, I think we need to understand it. And I would, and I would refer to the work of, of Joel Spring. S-P-R-I-N-G, Joel Spring is a primary document um, in understanding racism is prejudice plus power. Um, and, um, this, and so this idea that um, I cannot tell you, you can't vote. I, I can't tell you where to live or what schools to go to. Right? That is prejudice plus power. I can't take your history, erase it, or rewrite it, and then when you try to reclaim it, right, or restore it, I will call it revisionist history. I don't have that power. The, the um, originators, the, the, the scholars of, of, of critical race theory don't have that power to do those things. I can't tell you what curriculum should be in your schools. I can't tell you that if you don't like the curriculum in your schools, you can just move because you have the capital to do it. That's power. There's a lot of folks who do not have that. And so we have to be clear about what is actually racist, right? Um, versus what is bigoted or what is prejudiced. Um, these are power dynamics um, that have to be teased out, right? I can't tell you as a woman, well, I'm paying this man more because I'm not gonna tell you this, but he's a man. I don't have that power mm -hmm. to influence policies and laws over a period 
of decades and centuries. Um, and so um, just to be clear about that with respect to what racism is, um, I think that once again, with, 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 with school practices and procedures, um, in large, uh, critical race theory has become that boogeyman mm -hmm. in schools. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this again, spoiler alert, we will not be talking about this a year from now. Mm -hmm. But the black and brown people of their struggle will still be on the table. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add on um, to echo those sentiments is that, um, you know, are we embodying or do we support an anti uh, white framework? We don't. Um, do we support a racist framework? We don't. When we talk about CRT, as Dr. Hall has said, um, it is that boogeyman. Um, CRT provides us research around the construct of whiteness, but it doesn't provide us with things like stereotypes. It doesn't provide us with things uh, about as you look at other historical uh, research when you talk about um, African Americans, when you talk about other nationalities where research has been um, documented to talk about a framework of thinking about inferior thinking. Uh, individuals are not capable of doing uh, various tasks academically and those kinds of things. So when you talk about, um, is it preaching about being anti-white? It's not, it's not preaching about stereotypes, it's presenting a framework of research. And it's saying, here's the body of research. Now you, you interpret it, you interpret it, the body of research. It's not giving you any suggestions of what you should think or how your responses should be. That's up to the individual is presenting you with that information. And then just in response to school um, practices and procedures, um, I can't speak for every school district across the country. I can only speak for those that I have been um, affiliated with in the past and that that had not been something that had been taught or practiced uh, with students to have them do rankings and, and things of that nature. So again, to Dr. Hall's point, it's the other piece of it is how individuals are taking that on and how they're presenting it, which may be a misrepresentation of what critical race theory was intentionally designed to do. Thank you both. Um, so we are past the eight o'clock mark. So we do have to end tonight to respect everyone's time. I do apologize. We were not able to get to everyone's questions. We had over 40 and to answer all of them, we would have been here for several more hours. So I do apologize, but thank you both to our speakers, Dr. Strickland Dixon and Dr. Hall uh, for your time. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. So and, thank you. you know, this is, this is a really, you know, controversial topic. Um, we can always continue this conversation. So, so thank you all for being here tonight.